Hi and welcome to the speech. We will hear about um, high, th high throughput DNA sequencing. Um, Magnus will tell us about the basics. He will give us a short view in the history and in the future. And we will hear about chances, risk and challenges of this new technology. Um, please welcome Magnus. He has programmed Wikipedia, Wikipedia and works as a bioinformatician. I, I hate this word, I think. Okay. <laughs> Test and zwei A. Ah, okay. Um, I realize it's a talk after dinner or lunch for some. Uh, so, so if you if you fall asleep, uh, try not to snore too loud, as you might wake your neighbor. Um, I'll tell you a little about uh, DNA sequencing and the rather remarkable progress this field made in the last year. And this is where I work and where most of this uh, happens at the moment. It's in the UK where we're all under tight surveillance and uh, I'll have some about this later. Okay, um, little basics. Uh, as you might remember um, all life forms have DNA and my laser point is not working. Oh, there it is. Um, uh, they all have DNA uh, regardless of the level of complexity. Um, and you can go down from uh, chromosomes um, and uh, disentangle them and end up with a well-known double-stranded helix, which has uh, four bases that are uh, abbreviated with uh, A, C, G, and T. Um, hence the title of my talk, All Your Base. And uh, the genome size uh, does not correspond with organism size, organism complexity. So we go from uh, 3,500 bases with some bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria, uh, all the way up to human with 3 billion. But then we find some single-celled organism with 670 billion bases. So uh, uh, sequencing is uh, a challenge even with, with uh, some apparently simple organisms. How did it all start? Uh, started in the 1970s uh, by, by a, a, a team, I think, in France. Um, they sequenced uh, the aforementioned bacteriophage, 3,600 bases which took uh, uh, the entire team, I think, five or six years. And they were using uh, this phage because it has RNA instead of DNA, which is related, but for technical reasons, much more simple to sequence. Then people started developing DNA sequencing methods, and uh, one of these was a wandering spot method, which yielded 24 bases per experiment, which uh, involved quite a, uh, a few people working on it. And then finally, in 75, Frederick Sanger, who actually got not one but two Nobel Prizes in his life, um, he invented uh, a method called chain termination sequencing, which be, uh, quickly became the uh, most used uh, method because it actually yields uh, some tangible results. Um, so you have your strand of DNA. Here it's a, a, a single strand. They have to be separated for this. And then you have a so-called primer. The primer is a small DNA sequence, uh, uh, 20 or 30 bases. 
Okay, I hope this works better. And this uh, this primer uh, has to match your uh, DNA you want to sequence. And from there, you extend one base, then you look what base, what base it was, and you extend another base, and another, and another. Uh, and you have to record this somehow. And in the beginning, it was done with radioactive uh, 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 atoms that were incorporated in the bases that were added, uh, which, uh, having worked with radioactive gels, I can tell you it's a pain. Uh, everything is slightly radioactive after the experiment, so you have to wait like two, three days for everything to cool down before you can continue to work. Uh, but then they replaced the uh, radioactive parts with uh, fluorescent dyes, and uh, this is basically uh, uh, what uh, most of the sequencing that was done till last year. Uh, or beginning of this year, actually, and this is still done like this. Uh, looks like you get these um, four overlaid curves in, in four different colors, and the peaks all mean it's one more base there. And uh, uh, this looks all pretty, but uh, soon these peaks will start to degrade, and they will all bleed into each other, and then you have to stop with this sequencing because you can't tell the bases apart anymore. Uh, in practice, you get something between 300 and 1,000 bases uh, per run, as we say, per experiment. And we need a primer uh, to start with. And uh, most of you will remember the Human Genome Project uh, from the news in 2001 when uh, 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 the president of the U.S. and uh, the prime minister of the U.K. announced uh, that the human genome is now sequenced, which it wasn't, and it still isn't. Um, and they started in 1990, or they started earlier, but they uh, began the actual work in 1990, uh, was exactly this process. And they started at one end of a chromosome, or at least a fragment of a chromosome, and then they uh, was this primary in red, and then they sequenced some more. So now they know the sequence of this fragment. And then they take the end of this fragment and use it as a primer to start the next part, and so on. Now, a uh, human has three billion bases, and you can sequence roughly five to six hundred uh, per experiment. Uh, now, this has several drawbacks. Um, no, not yet. Uh, sorry. Uh, because, uh, first, you have to wait for this run to complete before you can even think about starting this run because you don't know this yet. And then you have to wait for this to complete before you can start the next part. Um, Uh, the other thing is that you actually need uh, scientists to do this because you can't just take the end of this uh, and run it. You, you have to uh, actually look at this whole sequence and sometimes you have to start a little more early because bases are not, uh, uh, they don't have the right GC content and blah, blah. Um, uh, so this required all highly trained personnel. And then in came this guy, Craig Wenter. Uh, who took a little more a business approach to this. Uh, quite literally, he tried to uh, beat the human genome project with the sequencing and then patent all the genes, uh, which luckily didn't work out. Otherwise, it would all be a, a patent violation. Um, and he said, well, uh, I, I don't actually want to do this in, uh, in a row like this, and then this, and then this. Uh, I just start somewhere, and I, st uh, I have my entire genome, uh, and I just start somewhere and get 600 bases. And then I do this again and again and again. And if I do this often enough, I get the entire genome, just by pure chance, uh, and I get these fragments overlapping, uh, 
uh, and then I uh, use a really big computer to puzzle them all together again. Um, this means first there's little need for scientific supervision, so uh, you can have some, some uh, guy who basically reloads a machine, presses a button, uh, and it produces another of these fragments, and then that gets stored, and then you do this again and again. And this scales up rather nicely, um, because uh, you, you add more machines, you add more people who operate the machines, uh, and you just scale up. This doesn't, the, the old method doesn't scale up, because it has to wait for each step. Um, and this was done, so, so parts of the uh, human genome were, even by the Human Genome Project, were assembled, uh, were sequenced this way. Um, and you, you might think, oh, that's, that's uh, 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 great and all, and there's now this new technology, originally called Solexa. Um, uh, this was then bought by a company called Illumina, who basically bought everything in this segment of the market. Um, again, with a chain termination method, you get uh, rather long reads compared to earlier methods, a few hundred bases in a stretch, uh, but it's still few, so um, uh, it, it takes a while to, to uh, uh, it takes a machine a while to run um, uh, one of these uh, fragments and uh, you can scale it up, but it's still kind of slow. And Solexa takes this method that Craig Venter thought of, uh, so-called shotgun sequencing, because like, uh, like a shotgun, you don't have to aim that carefully, just aim in the general direction of the target, pull the trigger, and uh, uh, things will work out fine from there. Um, so Solexa said, uh, well, we, uh, maybe we don't have to do these long uh, sequences. We do shorter ones, like uh, 30 bases, 40 bases. But we do lots of them. And uh, uh, with, with lots of them, I'm, I'm not uh, kidding. Uh, so what they do is they take um, DNA raw material and they fragment it to a certain size. So let's say uh, 200, 300, 400 bases. So they just uh, chop it apart in, in uh, some uh, uh, nebulization processes. I don't even know what they do exactly, but uh, this is what they end up with. So this is the original DNA fragmented to fragments of roughly uh, the same size. And then they uh, attach these fragments to glass chips. So millions and millions of these fragments uh, now stick to glass chip. And then they, uh, uh, they use a method called PCR to amplify this. So each single fragment uh, becomes a, a, a cluster of thousands and thousands of uh, uh, copies of this special fragment. And then they um, sequence these things all in parallel, and with each base, uh, for, for each base, they stop and take photographs of this. And this is really photographs, it's a, a high resolution digital camera. Um, and this is what it looks like it's not the screen from Poltergeist, uh, and it's not something from the Hubble telescope. This is uh, uh, what the Selexa sequencing looks like. So it produces lots and lots and lots of these images, which then have to be analyzed. To the right, you see the um, uh, Solexa machine. So each of these is one machine. Uh, and in here uh, is a so-called flow cell, which is this thing here. It's, it's rather tiny. It's like, like my laser pointer. Uh, and photographs are taken from this. So this is uh, a very, very tiny portion of this flow cell. Um, and if you do um, uh, 30, uh, let's say 35 bases, um, uh, which is the one end of these fragments that we made previously, uh, you will have to photograph this entire flow cell 
in this high resolution 35 times. And if you do what, what they usually do now, uh, you do so-called paired reads. So you take both ends um, of this fragment. Uh, you have to do it 70 times. And uh, uh, this produce, each machine per run produces four terabyte of image data. And this is already LZV compressed. Um, and uh, then computers run over this and uh, try to piece together from these little gray dots that you saw on the previous slide uh, what that means. So they have color filters there uh, and it's um, uh, actually four colors and you get four images for each possible base. Um, and the output that I see, so I'm not working with the uh, sequencing machines themselves, I work with the, with the uh, primary output, um, which is long lists of these data sets. So um, uh, these four lines represent one of these fragments that were amplified and then sequenced. So this is an individual name. Uh, this is, I think, 37 bases from one end. This is 37 bases from the other end. And there are, in this case, I think, about 200 bases missing. It's not that I cut them off uh, because they don't fit on the slide. Uh, I don't have that data. This data is lost. Uh, so you only know the ends of these fragments, but not what's in between. And then you have uh, here uh, a quality score, which is ASCII encoded, um, which basically says, oh, the machine was uh, uh, as a certain um, quality score of how sure the machine is that this is really a, a, an A in this case, um, which is, uh, believe me, not a reliable metric, so it's uh, <laughs> uh, best guess. Uh, so you get uh, uh, line, uh, lots and lots of lines of this. Uh, so each, each flow cell has eight lanes, which run in parallel and can carry different samples to be sequenced. And at the moment, I get per lane, I get about nine million of these. Uh, so it's, it's quite, a, uh, 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 quite a bag of reads. And this is what they look like in a so-called alignment. So as you can see, um, uh, the bases uh, in one column are always the same. It's a little hard to see probably. Um, uh, so everything here is a G and uh, these, these reads are aligned um, because there are multiple sequencing uh, strands of the same original molecule. So this, this base here, for example, has uh, been sequenced I don't know, 20, 30 times in this process. Uh, this is the same view, a little more condensed, so there's a little more data on here. And may maybe you can see this, um, uh, the ends are in blue and in gray is a missing part. Uh, so basically down here, imagine this is your uh, DNA, your chromosome, uh, uh, and it, uh, it goes along here. And this is where these reads fit. They were fitted to a reference sequence. Um, and uh, the blue means they, they are a perfect match, and the red means they are uh, uh, not matching the reference sequence at that point, but it's the best match that could be found. So uh, when you see the red here is clustering at this position, then you see, uh, uh, can assume very safely from that, this base in this sample is different than the one that was used uh, as a reference. So you might say, okay, it's a new sequencing technology, so what, who cares? Um, there, there's a, um, a, a website, a, a database on the internet called GeneBank that contains all uh, 
the sequences of all the organisms that were ever sequenced in the last 35 years. So there's human, there's mouse, there's uh, uh, some fish, there's bacteria, there's yeast, there's everything. Um, they were all sequenced with the old technology. Um, and this amounts to 200 gigabases or billion bases right, in this database. This is the uh, entire sum of human knowledge about uh, sequences in organisms. Um, so, um, uh, the Sanger Center, which I showed you in the beginning, uh, trialed uh, a few of these Selexa machines uh, at the end of last year, and uh, they started basically production in January. And in the first th three months, they produced more than that. Uh, so the, in, in three months, they produced more sequencing data than the entire world in 35 years, using 28 machines and 20 people to run them. And uh, as I said, uh, Sanger trials these machines uh, end of 2007. So when they started in 2008, uh, uh, it was still a rather experimental process. It was still learning uh, uh, how to use them correctly, what parameters to set uh, to get the maximum uh, output. Um, and of course, uh, uh, they improved on this. And uh, each machine is churning out uh, uh, 20 gigabases per run now, which is uh, 75 terabases or 70, uh, uh, 7.5 terabases or 7,500 gigabases per year. It's the current uh, output is actually a little more, more like nine terabases at the moment, because this was uh, written last month. So uh, y you can see how this is changing, and it is changing, uh, and uh, whole new modes are becoming available right now. So they're increasing um, the read lengths now from 35 or 37 to uh, 50. I've seen 50, works very well. There, um, uh, there are apparently trials with uh, 76 and even 100, which would put this in the same ballpark as the original Sanger sequencing which made one of these reads per run, and this does like nine million per run. Uh, so uh, this 7.5 terabases will at least double next year. It will probably be more. Uh, how am I doing? Oh, okay. Uh, so this is not uh, just, oh, it's a new technology that works a little better. Uh, this is this is a whole paradigm sh shift in this um, uh, uh, this this uh, area of science, um, and it uh, it has great potential, but it also has it poses great problems, because until the beginning of this year, uh, scientists kept uh, running around, so biologists, uh, medical people kept running around. Oh, I need my favorite gene sequence now, now, now. Um, uh, uh, why do I have to wait so long? And uh, 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 this year, and I've uh, uh, repeatedly heard people uh, uh, say that, uh, uh, oh, uh, here's, here's your uh, gene sequence. Oh, we, uh, we didn't uh, sequence it once, we sequenced it 20 times because we had a spare capacity. And I said, oh, what am I supposed to do with all this? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a real problem because there is no, uh, uh, there's no, algorithm, there's no software, there's no concept of how to deal with, this, uh, with all this data. Because for the last few decades, everything that was developed was developed uh, on the principle, oh, we have a sequence, now we have 20 people who can look at this single sequence. Um, and, and now people are drowning in data, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, uh, uh, a problem, problem gets uh, worse if you realize this, uh, oh, we let the computer puzzle it together to uh, one sequence. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, what you get is um, you have software that can puzzle these things together uh, to long pieces, uh, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 bases, but that's the end of it uh, because some uh, 
parts in uh, natural DNA, in our DNA, in every organism's DNA, um, uh, has certain structures like repeats. So it goes on AT, AT, AT uh, for, for, for thousands of bases. And uh, unless you can sequence through this entire stretch and see both ends of this repeat sequence, you don't know how long it is and you have no way of finding out how long it is. And uh, so uh, every time this occurs, you need some human to make a guess and puzzle it together. Um, well, let, let, let's, let's say you, you can puzzle it together. You have a new uh, genome now of some, some species you have uh, uh, no knowledge about otherwise in terms of sequence. This stuff needs to be annotated. Uh, it's, it's just a bunch of uh, very long strings and no one knows what they mean. So you have to go in there and uh, mark up, uh, oh, this is a gene. And uh, it's uh, not as trivial as it sounds because even today there is no uh, good way for automated annotation for this stuff. Um, uh, uh, if, if you let the best software run uh, over, over a human genome today, uh, you'll get probably 50% uh, false positives and 50% uh, of the genes that it misses. Um, uh, so um, automatic annotation is not the solution, at least not now. And uh, uh, you can only throw so many people at this because, again, people have to be trained for this. Uh, they have to know what they're doing uh, to annotate this stuff. And I've, uh, I, I know some of these people and they say, uh, you can do this for two, maximum three years. And after that, you go crazy whenever you see a screen with all this DNA on it, uh, because it just, you stare at this stuff eight hours a day. Uh, and it's, it's uh, 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 like, like a very complicated Tetris. Uh, <laughs> And you, you, you can play this occasionally, but uh, after three years of doing this every single day for eight hours, uh, uh, you just run away screaming. Uh, of course, uh, um, I want to mention the uh, other technology we use. Uh, so this is uh, um, a, sequences a sequencing machines put out lots of data. and. It's really lots, and it's getting more. Uh, as I said, they get more data from uh, from the machines, so it's it means more data uh, uh, is coming onto the servers. Um, so currently, we are generating about 300 terabytes per month, um, and that needs to be stored somewhere. Uh, we do have three petabyte in our farm at the moment, more or less, uh, uh, even the systems people couldn't tell me how much exactly it is, uh, because they're too busy uh, uh, adding new hard drives. This is uh, all that <laughs> some people do. They just plug in new hard drives un until the rack is full. Um, and uh, 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 actually, uh, was, even with that, they are losing currently. Uh, so just, just beginning of December, basically last thing I heard was, uh, uh, they locked down some of the of the uh, user space on the on the hard disks uh, because uh, uh, sequencing machines kept churning out new data. They didn't know where to put it, um, and uh, uh, so I hope it didn't blow to uh, I don't know where when I come back <laughs> uh, in January and uh, find the thing has uh, become a giant meltdown. Um, Backup is a problem. Uh, uh, they, they, have, they have robots. Uh, they have robots to store the stuff on tape. So the robots are uh, just changing tapes, putting the tape in. It's written, take, taken out. It has automated IDs and, and barcodes on it and all kinds of things. This, this is running 24 hours a day. Uh, but they have a backlog of, I think, half a year right now. Uh, which is not backup. It's it's it's, it's there's, a, there's a mirrored hard disk, probably in the same rack. Um, uh, and uh, 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 the computing people don't view it as a large problem. As uh, as you can see, they just say, "Oh, it's faster to rerun everything anyway." Uh, uh, they do have um, 
frozen copies of all the DNA that they sequenced, uh, so they could actually go back and uh, resequence the stuff. Uh, it won't be exactly the same data because this, this whole process is rather random, but the results from it, they should be the same again. Should be. Uh, believe me, I've seen stuff there. Um, um, uh, also, this, this whole analysis is uh, kind of demanding. Uh, so just, just um, uh, uh, running the image analysis on, on uh, four terabytes per run um, uh, uh, kind of takes, uh, takes some steam. So we have at the moment uh, about 4,000 CPU cores uh, in the farm and uh, uh, many of them are used for, for this image analysis and then of course uh, what do I do with, with these uh, lands of reads I showed you. Um, uh, this stuff has to run somewhere as well uh, to, to, to give me a better picture of what it actually is and uh, what's in there. Um, why? Why are we doing this? Uh, why do we bother? So uh, what, what, what are we looking at? Um, so this is kind of a tree of life uh, and I've marked some of the things uh, we look at. This is the whole, the whole uh, 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 primate thing here, uh, and there's related mouse uh, uh, and pigs. There's zebra fish because zebra fish is a, is a model organism in biology, um, which has its own problems because uh, uh, after after they sequence a mouse and they were still sequencing human, they said, "Oh, let's do zebra fish," um, and uh, uh, turn out, "Oh, we need uh, this amount of DNA." And they calculated, and uh, a single fish doesn't have enough DNA. So they took, uh, and you can, you can believe this literally, they took, I think, four or five fish, put them in a blender. <laughs> Mooly legs, you remember that. Um, and and a sequence from there. Um, turns out individual zebra fish have these strange polymorphisms. Um, uh, so, so, uh, uh, for, for the same area with five fish, you get five different results. And assembling that is kind of tricky. Um, uh, so the no doing zebra fish was a, was a, was a new technology uh, which has its own drawbacks because currently these reads are actually too short to reassemble a new, a completely new genome. Uh, this will be fixed or was, was a 50 and 100 base pairs uh, that we're seeing now. That, that are coming through next month, um, beginning of 2009. Um, but, but currently, it's, it's basically not possible because it's, it's just uh, uh, the reads are too short. And uh, uh, what, what we can do is if we have a reference genome, so the same species or a related species, uh, we can map this stuff back and see, okay, all this is identical. I see this in the reference and in the, in the new stuff. And then we can look at the rest and say, okay, this kind of fits here. So maybe it's just a small variation. And then we have a, a whole bucket of things uh, that don't go anywhere. And uh, uh, there you can try and reassemble it because there are probably new genes or genes that are so altered from the reference uh, that they're not recognizable anymore. Um, we have some worms, some plants, lots of bacteria. Fun thing is uh, uh, bacteria are so small you can probably bundle a few per lane. Um, uh, some, some guy gave us uh, Anopheles uh, sample, so this is a mosquito that, that carries uh, the malaria parasite. And uh, they said, okay, here's a sample of Anopheles, we, we clean this and all. So we extracted DNA, put it on the uh, Selexa machine, uh, got lots of reads back, turns out it's not Anopheles. Um, we don't actually know what it is. Our best guess is um, they, they uh, uh, accidentally took something from the mosquito gut uh, uh, because we uh, partially assembled some of uh, 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 mosquito gut bacteria um, from some, some uh, fun viruses and uh, uh, I found about 1% uh, Yersinia pestis which uh, causes black death, so I'm quite glad I'm not in sample preparation. Um, um, we have some 
tryponosomes and malaria in red because this is what I am actually working on. Uh, and there's also fun stuff being done. So um, uh, some, some people are trying to extract uh, Neanderthal uh, DNA from, from uh, teeth they found because uh, uh, that's the most likely uh, place to find DNA after tens of thousands of years um, uh, because a tooth actually protects the DNA inside or it can protect the DNA. Um, they found some, some uh, frozen mammoth in, in the, in the uh, um, uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russian permafrost and uh, they dug this out and uh, I heard some people ate this stuff, it was still fresh, um, but uh, I, pro probably not true, I hope. Um, uh, so so they're, they're assembling the woolly mammoth um, and I think they're modeling it on, on some, some African elephant, I'm not sure. Um, and they, they uh, um, just, just a few months ago, I saw the complete platypus genome. So this is a uh, Schnabeltier of Deutsch, um, uh, which is fun because it's kind of a uh, little bit of everything, uh, like PHP. Um, uh, okay, now, now you think, okay, now I, 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 I've heard enough, I, I'll buy it, I want my genome sequenced. Uh, well, uh, in the Human Genome Project, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the Human Genome Project cost all in all about five hundred million dollars for one genome. Um, um, the the, the um, method invented by Sanger, the uh, uh, chain termination method, uh, which was used there, is still available, of course. Um, also, we threw all the machines out right now. Um, uh, and thanks to Craig Wenter and his shotgun sequencing, um, the cost is down to about $10 million uh, for one genome. Um, with the current state of Selexa sequencing, you get one genome for $100,000, but you get it with a uh, so-called 20x coverage, which means on average, each position has been sequenced 20 times. Why do I need this? If you want the complete genome, everything uh, for sure, you have to go to like 20x coverage uh, because it's not equally distributed. So there are some regions that have 50x coverage, uh, sequenced 50 times, and some that are only sequenced 10 times. And so uh, the lower you go with your uh, with the coverage you aim for, uh, the less likely it gets that you get all of your genome sequenced. Um, uh, but if you uh, look at uh, 1x coverage, theoretically, uh, would be about, uh, what, 50,000? No, $5,000 actually, 5,000. And um, sometimes you don't need the entire genome because only uh, uh, a small portion of our genome actually uh, uh, is genes, most of it is, is uh, um, whatever it is, we don't really know what it is. Um, they used to say it's garbage, but it's not. We don't know yet. Um, um, probably PGP. Um, um, and if, if you just go for this coding region, so this is the regions that are actually genes, um, uh, uh, you drop some order of magnitudes in this cost. And so uh, Sanger and other institutes are currently running a thousand genomes project which will uh, sequence all the genes of a thousand people from various parts of the world and uh, then look at this and compare it and look for uh, possible disease markers so there are people with, with certain diseases in there um, and see what, what uh, comes up. That's still too expensive uh, for for uh, you and me to to buy like like a, a hundred thousand dollars. Still, well, have to uh, let go of this Porsche. Uh, um, uh, but but there were these companies like this um, 23andMe, which is actually uh, owned by some uh, 
guy who also owns large parts of Google. Um, uh, and they, they said they'll do it for $500, $400, whatever. Um, this, because they don't do sequencing, they uh, do another technology called genotyping. Um, they uh, check for single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs in short, which is basically um, um, uh, a one base change at a certain position. So at this position, uh, uh, they say normally people have an A there, but this guy has a T there. That would be a, uh, um, a SNP, so a one base change, basically. Um, and there are chips, there are not computer chips, they're glass chips. Uh, and uh, uh, companies, they, they can prefix um, this position, a copy of this position, and the surrounding genomic region, like a few dozen bases in either direction, uh, on this chip. And they do one of them was the uh, so called normal variation and the uh, alternate variation. So one was an A, one was a T. Uh, and then you basically uh, uh, pour your DNA on that. Uh, and whatever copy you have uh, will stick to one of these um, uh, uh, prefixed sequences. And you can detect this again with fluorescence, again with photographic modes. Uh, so there's again a picture of a chip and it's uh, glowing in pretty colors and uh, from, uh, because you know where each uh, variation is positioned on the chip, you can say, oh, I see this variation in the sample. Um, there are currently chips um, that, have, uh, that can carry one million uh, positions on a single chip. Uh, so, so when I, when I uh, started studying, uh, this was barely developed. This was there, there was an experimental chip that had ten, not not ten million, ten of these things on it, and they're now up to a million. I think next year we'll see uh, two million. Um, uh, this is much cheaper, much faster, and easier to handle than sequencing, but it has a, uh, several big drawbacks as well. Um, it finds only known variations. So you have to actually look for a variation uh, in order to see it. If there's a variation in the sample that no one ever heard of and or no one's testing on this chip, uh, you don't see it. Also, it's limited to these uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, so larger variation is usually not detected. And there's also a high error rate when used on an individual. Um, uh, which doesn't invalidate its use entirely uh, uh, because th th there are lots of studies um, um, currently done that sequence uh, or that genotype. Um, let's say 5,000 people from Finland. Um, and uh, you, you have errors there, you have uh, um, uh, on, on the chip, you have you have bases that are not detected in some samples, but if you have 5,000 data points for a single position, well, if you lose 200, so what? Uh, uh, this is um, uh, very useful for large-scale studies, and we had uh, some large study uh, coming through, like like middle of the year. Someone might have heard about it. it was big in, in Nature. Um, uh, they have detected lots of of uh, markers for, for obesity and for, for all kinds of diseases. Um, and they're still working on this data because it's a statistical process with a million positions and let's say 15,000 people tested. Uh, and each, each of these people has one million positions tested. You can't actually look at it by hand. Um, uh, you'll have to use statistical methods and uh, they in turn can be kind of error prone in either direction. Um, so, um, when I say all the sequencing is, is uh, still too, too expensive and maybe it, it uh, also takes too long because uh, one run can take several days on Selexa. Um, 
Uh, maybe Mosa doesn't concern us yet. However, um, there are a few companies who are developing the next next generation sequencing. And uh, uh, what, what they have uh, uh, is, is, is pretty scary. Um, and uh, uh, most of it is actually believable. So it's, uh, there's uh, some vaporware out there, sure. But um, uh, some of what they have is, is, uh, is real. They've shown it in, in small variation. And, and uh, they'll, uh, they're in the process of scaling this up. So one of them is Pacific Biotech. Uh, just a note, I don't have shares of any of these companies. Um, uh, so they do something called single enzyme sequencing. Uh, they use uh, the enzyme that uh, our bodies or m uh, many organisms use to duplicate their DNA. Uh, and they use it for sequencing, which means it's uh, very accurate um, and very fast. Uh, so what they do is they take a single enzyme uh, and they take, again, some glass chip or whatever, and they uh, punch a 20 nanometer hole in this. And they fix this single enzyme in this hole, and then they uh, uh, basically, again, with, with fluorescent markers, uh, watch the enzyme run through the DNA. Uh, and this will actually uh, yield uh, uh, thousands and thousands of bases, so very, very long reads, with very, very high accuracy. But it's, uh, 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 you might think, okay, it's, a, uh, it's, it's very nice, but it's only one enzyme, but they multiplex it. So they put thousands, ten thousands, hundreds thousands, I don't know uh, how many uh, of these holes was each as an enzyme in it uh, on a single chip, and they all run in parallel. And they claim uh, they will eventually do one human genome in a few minutes for $100, announced for 2010, so around the corner. Um, uh, one year and, well, three days or something. Um, <laughs> uh, so so the, this is quite, um, uh, may, 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 maybe the end result is not that extreme, uh, though I, I, uh, I imagine it could be. Uh, and if you, if you think about it, uh, at that point, uh, the sequencing centers like the Sanger will basically die off because every single hospital will have at least one of these. Um, and uh, if, if you come in and you have some disease that even house can diagnose, um, uh, and you have a gold or platinum credit card, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll take a sample of your, of your DNA and uh, pour it onto that machine, and a few minutes later, uh, they, they can tell you, oh, you have this and this and this and this genetic disease. Um, uh, and th there, there are other companies, so there's uh, Helicos, which will do single molecule sequencing, um, which will um, uh, uh, have several advantages. One, you need very little DNA for this. Uh, so here's uh, uh, CSI next generation. Um, and you have um, uh, Nanopore, they, they do something similar to Pacific Biotech. Um, some, some social and political news. So I'm living and working in the UK of my own free will. Um, uh, and I, I thought I'd gather some of the, uh, of the news that are uh, heard while I was there. Uh, which kind of relate to this new technology. Um, so some, some uh, uh, British scientists said they can predict uh, someone's last name uh, based on their DNA. Uh, this, this only works for males because the Y chromosome is only passed from father to son, like the last name. Um, in, in most cases, at least. Uh, so um, uh, if, if the police goes out and uh, uh, they find some, some male DNA and they uh, put it through some genotyping or sequencing or whatever, uh, and uh, 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 let's say some of, uh, some of your male relatives got into the system somehow, and by pure chance, 
uh, their DNA looks in some parts like the suspects. Uh, you're on the list. I have no doubt about that. Um, this, is, this is a current situation uh, in the UK. They're very big on these DNA fingerprints, which is a little different than genotyping or sequencing. It's a little uh, uh, more simplistic, uh, but still. So they have uh, 7.5 of the population, some say 10%, uh, already in there. And that, that's people who were not even charged with a crime. They were taken to the police station for some reason, and they took the DNA and then said, okay, you can go now, we have your DNA. Um, um, there, was, there was a suggestion um, uh, that for, for not wearing your seat belt, the police should be able to take your DNA and keep it indefinitely. Um, uh, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't think it's in, in, in power now, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised for fighting the terrorists. We will have this soon. You will not be surprised that the European Court of Human Rights just a month ago ruled this database violates basic human rights. Uh, no one in the UK did anything about this so far, and I, frankly, I don't expect they will. Um, so in the last five minutes, uh, I'll just uh, briefly show you uh, why I'm still working with this, if it's so evil, um, because it actually has some, some nice applications. So I'm working on malaria. Um, uh, malaria infects about, uh, uh, well, up to, up to uh, half a billion people each year, uh, with, with uh, uh, one to two million death each year, uh, mostly children under five because the immune system is not developed enough. Um, and so what we do is we, we uh, sequence, uh, we use this new technology to sequence individual parasites that were taken from people, so, so basically blood from the arm uh, is enough to sequence the parasite that uh, resides in the red blood cells. Um, uh, uh, We've, we've taken samples basically from, from uh, everywhere. The ones from the UK you see here were taken from an airport, and no one knows what pe where the people came from. Um, so we just put them there. Um, uh, uh, we have 95 samples now, as I said. And here's one thing we actually did was it. Um, uh, when we compare these sequences, um, uh, and then group them by, by a similarity. Let's say this is a, for the mathematically inclined, this is a principal component analysis. And uh, as you can see, we can tell apart uh, uh, African samples and uh, Papua New Guinea and Southeast Asia pretty well. So th this is Brazil, which apparently is like Southeast Asia, uh, which brings me to, to some other things. We are planning on uh, doing a public website uh, where uh, we will show distilled views of this. So this is a mock-up from, from another paper, actually, but we'll try to, to use this technology for, for basically using live data uh, that we can see where, um, uh, 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 where outbreaks are, where resistance outbreaks are, uh, how, uh, how, how uh, parasites move, how fast they move, where they move, if they have roots on which they move, if they move with the um, uh, mosquitoes, if they move more with the people. Because if you get malaria uh, in, in Africa and then move to, to uh, Asia uh, and a mosquito stings you, it will suck up some of these uh, parasites and if it infects the next person, he'll get uh, your strain that you carried with you. Um, uh, there's also uh, uh, this could lead to these population networks. Just, uh, just a mock-up graphic here. Um, uh, there's, there's lots more uh, we can do with this. Uh, multiclonal infections. So a single patient can be inf infected by multiple strains of malaria simultaneously, which is probably not fun. Um, uh, as I said, how, how the parasites are travel. Um, Large-scale variations, so parts of the DNA can be deleted, uh, new d genes can be inserted, or uh, uh, sequence can be inverted. Copy number variations, there can be multiple copies of a single gene, which um, 
relates to, to resistance, um, are completely new genes that somehow more or less spontaneously evolved. Uh, and that's it. <laughs>